is handy, isn't it? Light, it's light. What does that mean, light? Does that mean it's not enough light? Oh, is that why? I'm <laughs> sorry, I just had to let you have it. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't miss his chance when he gets it. <laughs> no, straight in there. Yeah. Straight in. What did you just say, Carl? I said, there might be some mishap on tape because somebody left the lens cap on. Yeah, and what did you call me, Carl? <laughs> was, it, was it a fucker here? Yeah. How rude. It was very rude. I apologise for freezing. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking c. But you enjoyed it, really. Yeah. <laughs> Porcupine Tree started off as basically a, a kind of solo bedroom experiment. I mean, it was just like me having fun in my little bedroom studio at my parents' place. Well, actually, at the beginning, it was like almost a joke. I was something I was going to put out there and pretend it was this obscure kind of 60s psychedelic uh, experimental pop group and which is why I ended up with the name Porcupine Tree because I wanted something a little bit psychedelic and kind of a bit silly, a bit zany. So I kind of got stuck with that name. Anyway, um, I started off making cassettes, uh, released a couple of cassettes just by selling them through mail order. One of the cassettes came to the attention of a label called Delirium Records, who were just starting up. To cut a long story short, they ended up putting out a vinyl album collected from the first few cassettes I'd done, which did very well, picked up radio play, got some press. So Porcupantry very quickly became something which actually had the potential to be something more than just a, a kind of bedroom experiment. And I started to take it much more seriously. And three albums in, I decided, okay, I need to, I need to put a band together. I need to go and play this music live. If it's going to, if it's going to reach an order, a bigger audience, if it's going to continue to build up, then it needs to be a proper touring kind of entity. So I put the band uh, line up together just by using musicians that I already knew and that I worked with, like Colin from my hometown, Hamel Hempstead, Richard Barbieri, who I'd already worked with in No Man. Chris Maitland, who I'd also worked with in No Man, and we came together and it just clicked. When I joined the band, it happened in a different way, really. Stephen just asked me to be part of um, the second album, Up the Downstair, and to add electronics. And so I, I worked on that, and then I, I worked a little bit on Sky New Sideways as well. We weren't really a band until Signify, and um, that's when the gig started, uh, I guess at the end of 93. In Europe, we've gone from tiny clubs and tiny venues, that, with the exception, a couple of exceptions, there are a few places where we seem to do really well without, you know, we just came out of nowhere in Italy and played to 1,500 people in Rome. But outside of Rome, <clears throat> we were doing tiny clubs, sometimes to sort of 30 to 50 people, at some, you know, and we gradually built that up. Well, it was both fun and grim. Um, that's how all these things are in the beginning the hardship of, of getting around and trying to do gigs on, on a very tiny budget in very uncomfortable circumstances. But it's, it's also a laugh and it's also a time where the band feels the most together in a way because it's kind of you against every, everything else or you against all the circumstances and people and places and <laughs> environments, everything, it's tough. Um, but. As with any band, I think that's when that's when bands are really strong. We'd supported. I can remember Gong, Hawkwind, Dream Theatre, Marillion, you know, Sonic Youth. Uh, we supported Amondol, Amondol too. We got a bit of a reputation as a live act, and we had we had definitely built up an audience of people that would come and see us. It was almost impossible to tour America because it was so expensive just to get everyone there. I think we'd done one tour on a real kind of shoestring budget and still managed to lose money. So I think it was a situation where we knew that if we wanted to be able to tour internationally that we would have to have the support of a, like a major record company.
so by the time we were doing Stupid Dream and Lightbulb Sun, um, the music was becoming a little bit more accessible as well. Um, Stephen was kind of um, more into kind of pop, pop music in a way and the, the whole construction and compression of a, of a great song in a shorter form. And we all really enjoyed working around those uh, parameters. And um, it started to build from there, from Signify, Recordings, Light Bulb Sun, Stupid Dream. That was kind of the whole second era, what I would say, of Porcupine Tree. We've done a few albums already with Delirium and then we'd moved on to K-Scope which uh, was a bigger label with a better distribution and we'd steadily done better and bigger gigs. I think I'm a good judge of, of character and of um, people's potential. There wasn't any doubt in my mind um, when I started working with Stephen that I thought that something was going to happen. He had a respect for what I'd done previously. We kind of have an understanding. In fact, Stephen has an understanding with each person of the band, but in a different way. So in our way, he, he kind of got what I was doing. He got the subtleties and he got the whole sound design thing. And we both have a love of electronic music. I think by getting involved with Porcupine Tree, I think that gave it something a little bit more different and more contemporary. <laughs> It was a very steady, slow building process of making music, releasing albums, doing fairly small scale touring, but keeping faith with a small but very loyal audience and allowing it to build up in a very kind of organic word of mouth way. And then we arrive at this point uh, where we're about to record In Absentia. And that was obviously, this album was a very big record for us. It kind of changed, it kind of changed everything really. got the attention of people that thought they could make serious money out of us, I guess. Because you don't get a major label deal for because somebody loves you. Artistically, I think, developed as well. So I guess everything was in place and we, you know, we were a solid team, as it were. We were starting to get a lot of interest from America, actually, and uh, in particular, Lava Records, which was an Atlantic label. We were fortunate enough to have uh, a few people there who were fans of the band. So in effect, we were doing a few showcases in the States and it ended with uh, quite an important gig at the bottom line. Jason tonight. What's, okay. next? What's next? What's next? What happens now? Well, they're happens working now? on a big marketing plan right now. They're all meeting every day and coming up with a big fancy marketing plan as to how they're going to spend all the money on us, particularly the $25,000 that we passed on the video that should be reinvested in something. Oh yeah, we want to talk about that. Why can't we make a video? Last time we want to make a video, don't we? Yeah. Last time wants to make a video. Okay. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> no, not that kind of video. He wants to make a promo. Our English manager was a guy called Richard Allen who'd, who'd been actually initially the, the boss of Delirium Records and he kind of ended up being the, the manager of Porcupine Tree by default when we, we moved to other labels because he knew the band and he knew the background and, and all that stuff. So one day this guy called Andy Leff, American guy, you know, full of all the American blah, 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 calls up Richard and says, you know, I think the band's awesome and I can get this band a record deal if you give me the chance. I think there was a lot of discussion about it, about whether this was, you know, something we wanted to do. And I was like, me personally, I was like, yeah, completely. So I was like, yeah, let's give this guy a chance. I've got nothing to lose. So we met him. We gave Andy Left the opportunity to help his band because we needed help, especially outside of the UK. When you're working and uh, dealing with people in the States, you need a different kind of approach on, on a business level. 
Richard Allen had been great on all levels for us in the UK and in Europe, but he wasn't the right, and I'm sure he admitted it, he's not the right kind of persona to walk in to a room in the States and start, you know, basically bullshitting, which is what it's all about. And Andy was your archetypal kind of American manager, um, very forward, very uh, proactive, very willing to talk up the band. He was a fan of the band as well, so. To his credit, he, he did what he said he was going to do. And he went out and he got us this record deal. And so Andy ended up being the manager of the band for, for, the, for the rest of its, you know, the rest of its duration. I can't say enough bad things about managers all my life, right the way through the industry. I've just had bad experiences with managers. And I can't say I've ever met the manager or, or had any experience of a manager who genuinely looked after my interests whether as a solo artist or as an artist within a band. Um, but anyway, that's, that's business. Business, uh, unfortunately, is, is always a part of it. There's always a slight a friction between the American sensibility and the English sensibility. Americans always tell you that everything's going to be amazing and you're going to have a guitar-shaped swimming pool before the end of the year and all this stuff. English people are always like, yeah, right, but, you know. And so there was always a little bit of that going on. I'm not attracted to people that are interested in money. I like people that are ambitious. They say, yeah, we can do this and we can do that and we can sell lots of records and we can sell out these venues. But at the same time, I've got to understand, I've got to believe inside that these guys are, number one priority for them is to do it with integrity and it's about the art. And all the people I've ever worked with, almost without exception, um, would, would fit that description. He was very good at telling us what we wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but he definitely had a, no, he definitely, give him his due, he had a bit of positive energy. That first tour we did, I think it was, if I remember rightly, it was all based around a festival we did in Pennsylvania, and the festival was kind of paying for the whole tour. And the last show we did was this show in New York at a club called The Bottom Line. Yes, I mean, at that stage we were happy to do anything, to be honest, just to go to America and just play. Also, pretty soon we got on, on a support uh, slot with Yes, yeah, again, it was, uh, we had the, the, the whole thing of it being quite um, tough. I think we were travelling around in, a, in an ex-Greyhound bus with a couple of characters who couldn't um, navigate. So we would end up kind of going in different directions and you'd end up in a town and then actually pass it and realise it that's where you were playing. And it was, yeah, again, very funny. By that time, Porcupine Tree had a bit of a following in New York particularly. We had a following. So it was completely packed. When Andy Carp came along from, from Lava to see this show in New York, he saw there was this venue that was completely full of people that knew every word of every song. And I think he was quite impressed by that. That kind of swayed him in a way. So that too was really important, you know, it's... And, you know, and I think we were also a really good live band. We were, we were even by that time, we, we had been uh, touring a lot, you know, not a lot, but we'd, we'd done a fair amount of shows by that time and we'd learned our craft. And I think we were quite impressive as a, as a live band. Yeah, it turned out fine, purely because of the, uh, the strength of the band, the, you know, the performance and the vibe of the group. Opportunities like that don't come along that often and also it was quite a surprise. <laughs> I, did, I think it had been going on for some time that we knew there was some interest. Um, we knew that we were perhaps due a bit of a break. I think we would have signed with any record label in the States if it had shown interest. We were more keen to sign with them just by the fact it was Atlantic Records, I mean, a historic label. That felt really exciting. There was no doubts from, from our side. Um, we were really happy to proceed with it. These are things where it's just a, it's just a chance and you have to take them. Well, Andy Carp was very, very uh, enthusiastic about the band, and I knew that. And when he met us, he was polite and gracious and, and very easy to talk to. I guess we knew we weren't going to get a better offer from anybody else. You know, he was the kind of person, the, the wish list A&R guy, it seemed, at the time. You know. So we were very lucky, in a way, to, to have someone like him working there at that time that kind of got it you know I can't say he, you know I can't say it really worked out for him that well because we didn't sell millions of records for him but we did okay you know and I think of all the bands that that label signed around that time I'm gonna bet we're the only one that people still remember because Lava Atlantic signed a lot of bands around that time 
and I, c I can barely remember the names of most of them. So I think, in a way, he was kind of proved right. We, we're the band that kind of endured, you know, our legacy endured. He was going to sell this kind of weird experimental album based music to the millions of, you know, unwashed across America, which was a lovely dream, you know. And we kind of all had it at the time. We got the deal, and that's where things started to change, and Stephen started making preparations, I guess, for In Absentia. The Doom Meister at play. Yeah. Give us some Doom chords, Richard. All right, I'll choose your ones then. The main thing that happened around the time in, in my kind of, not so much in my personal life, but certainly in, in my listening tastes, was that I really developed an interest in metal music and quite extreme metal music. And I think it was quite an exciting time for heavy music. I mean, I was working with the Swedish band Opeth and learning a little bit more about how those guys think about music and how they make music. And that definitely rubbed off on my own writing at that time. And I think what was really important is because there was this long period between the previous two records, Stupid Dream and Lightbulb Sun, which were almost made back to back, I mean, made literally within months of each other. So I think it's like two and a half years or something. I had suddenly had all this time, and I had all this time that I was able to write a lot more music than I would have written for previous albums. I mean, I wrote about 20, 25 songs, and even those songs went through lots of different sort of stages of development, you know, changing them, altering the arrangements. Remember a song like Heart Attack in a Lay-By, for example, started off with like dr full drums and heavy riffs, and, it's be and eventually the version I arrived at was this very stripped down ballad. And, and it's interesting to see how those songs develop when you have the time to reflect. I was really impressed, really, really strong. I mean, Stephen had taken the demo process quite a long way. I didn't used to like because I always wanted to be involved in shaping the arrangements or, or kind of having more input. Um, but sometimes when he presents a demo and it just sounds really good, then, um, you know, you, you can't really argue with that. If I hear something and it sounds great, then I'm not going to play over that part if it's already sounding really good. So that's, that's the way I looked at it. And I just thought the material was, was really strong. All of us had very wide uh, taste. I can remember that we were driving around on the previous tour and listening to a lot of Meshuggah in the van. And we all liked it, you know. It Interesting in it, it had this kind of brutality on the one side, which was new for Porcupine Tree. Um, it's quite a hard, heavy sound. Um, but also this, this, this beautiful side to it as well. The bass player Colin embraced it straight away because he, he always loved heavy music. He'd grown up with bands like Killing Joke. So he loved that kind of brutal uh, sound. So he was encouraging me. Richard, I think, was worried, not because he didn't like it, but because he was not sure how the keyboards would kind of integrate into this new sound. And to his credit, he found a way to integrate his keyboards into it in an unbelievable way, you know. Um, again, very innovative way to find ways to use electronic music and keyboard textures within the context of heavy sound is not something I think any other keyboard player I can think of would have would have been able to do that the way he did. Uh, so he kind of, you know, I think once he found his place within the music, he loved it. <laughs> Where you off, am I? Not really. I'd say it's one of the hardest albums of Porcupine Trees to, to integrate what I do into that. But I think it's one of the, well, it's one of the best two Porcupine Tree albums, definitely. So by the time we actually came to record in Absentia, I think we just had the strongest bunch of songs that the band has ever had. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about previous to that and subsequent to that. We never ever had that, that kind of opportunity again to spend so much time writing the music and obviously I was still writing 
five percent of it myself at that time so it was a real luxury for me to be able to come up with so much music and knowing that it was going to be the first album for a major label wanting it to be you know a real statement and a real strong record we booked into a studio in colchester to do some sort of pre-production which was to play through all the material and so that we could the idea being that we could turn up to america and whatever studio which we hadn't booked just yet but we only lasted a few days in the studio <laughs> So uh, that was the point at which Chris, uh, well, Chris was asked to leave the band, basically. I forget how close it was to the, the date we were supposed to fly to America to start recording, but it was pretty close. It was, I think it was within a few weeks. And we started to rehearse, and Chris obviously was not happy. He was not enjoying playing the new music. He was messing about a lot, and I was very frustrated because I thought, this is our big chance. It reached a point, a boiling point, where something happened, the, the consequence of which was that Chris was asked to leave the band. And it was a really foolish thing to do, really, at the time, because we had the major record label now finally investing in us and seeing the band falling apart, literally on the eve of making the record. And thank goodness that Richard said, you know what? we should talk to Gavin. He would be perfect for this. And I was like, can he really do this real heavy, muscular music? I just knew to call, it was like the bat phone. I put the, put the big light in the sky, I think. Gavin Harrison, and then Gavin would be sitting at home as he always is, obviously. And he'd look out the window and he'd see it in the sky and he'd pick up the, the Gav phone. And uh, that's, great. That's, that's more or less, how it happened, really, and Stephen said, well, do you, do you think, he, you know, will he be up to it? I said, yeah, he'll be up to it. He said, well, I, I definitely want to audition him. I think Steve said to me, yeah, maybe this guy can play, but can he rock or something like that? <laughs> In 1986, I was on tour with Iggy Pop for his Blah 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 album and tour. Later on, you know, just working as a, as a freelance professional drummer, really, and worked with a lot of pop stars, uh, you know, like Paul Young and Lisa Stansfield and Level 42. I had quite a go in Italy working with some Italian stars like Claudio Baglioni and Eros Ramazzotti. You know, just doing tours and sessions, that sort of thing. And in 1990, I met Richard Barbieri. We were both working for a, an Italian singer. And we stayed in contact, we stayed friends, and I think we worked on another couple of projects in the mid-90s. I knew going through um, knowing Jacko. So we, we, we'd met each other quite a few times, and um, I'd heard a lot of a lot of the stuff he'd done and Jacko would always be singing his praises. In 2001 Richard invited me to go and see Porcupine Tree play at uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire in London and I went to see the band I didn't know anything about them and after an hour I thought well oh, that's enough isn't it so um, I mean I didn't know any of the songs or any of the things but I, so I got a general impression of what it was about so I left after an hour and I sent him a text saying I didn't feel well. That's right, he came to one of those shows. Yeah, he said it was a load of old rubbish, um, but it was nice to see us. About nine months later, he called me up and said, uh, you know that band that you came and saw last year? Well, our drummer's just left. Are you available in about four weeks time to come to uh, New York and play on our record, which was in absentia? You know, we'll just pay you as a session musician and you can come and, and do it like that. And I said, yeah, okay. Uh, Steve, I didn't know. 
Colin I'd actually met a couple of times because he worked in a local music shop and he was also a student of a very good friend of mine called Martin Elliott, a fantastic bass player. So I didn't know Steve at all, other than the fact that I'd seen him, you know, at the concert the year before. I thought it was an arrogant <laughs> really. <laughs> so I made Richard and Gavin book a rehearsal studio so that Gavin could play through the songs. And this is like about a week before we were due to go to America. So it was really, if it, that hadn't gone well, it would have been a fucking disaster, you know. The whole thing would have been falling apart. History would have been different. But of course, history uh, tells us now that Gavin completely nailed it. And, and by the end of the first song, which was Blackest Eyes, I was like, this guy's amazing. And it's exactly what this band needs. He should be part of something that is going to showcase what, what his talents because I think previous to that, he wasn't known enough. He should, you know, he really should have been known. The sense of relief, you cannot imagine the sense of relief. Being able to call up Andy Leff and say, don't worry, everything's gonna be amazing. That was a very bittersweet time, you know, the, the bitterness of losing a member, but then the sweetness of knowing that, you know what, this, this is gonna be better than ever now. I think Steve was nervous that we'd get to New York and I wasn't the right kind of drummer. So I think that put his mind at rest. And then within about two weeks later, we were off to New York to Avatar to um, record that record. That was a really scary few weeks. The days, the few days between Chris leaving the band and me hearing Gavin play Blackest Eyes, that period of time, however long it was, two weeks or whatever it was, I couldn't sleep, you know, and, and I was scared. I thought, look, I've got the best set of songs I've ever had. We've got the major record label behind us. The guitar-shaped swimming pool beckons, and I've just fired the drummer. You know, it was, it, it was a weird time. But of course now it's all, you know, water under the bridge as they say. Mm. Bloody how'd you do it? <coughs> oh, right. oh zoom, there we go. Oh there we go. I've sussed it. Yeah, all right, I might film, yeah. I'm gonna film in here. We were recording at a studio called Avatar Studios, which is a legendary studio, it has a legendary room, which is the room we were recording in. Very live sounding room, and we wanted a big live drum sound and it was it sounded fan Gavin playing in that room just sounded fantastic. Only one. Okay, this is Gavin, our new drummer. Go for it, Gavin. Show him what you can do, mate. There'd be a lot of very famous recordings done in that room, and it's got a legendary large wood room, which is just ideal for drums. So I was very excited to go there. I think it's one of the best sounding rooms I've ever played in. You know, uh, Paul Northfield, the engineer, was great, and um, we got a really good sound pretty much straight away. And for the first time ever within Absentia, whatever you need, to make this record is available to you. And I can remember Gavin setting his kit up and I mean it sounded good to me as soon as he started playing anyway so um, yeah I think there, immediately there was a lot of sonic options that we had that wouldn't have been possible in a cheaper place. And then we set the drums up, Paul put the mics on, you know we tested the drums for maybe 20 minutes and did a couple of test recordings getting ready for the analogue digital decision, because that was quite a big one. Very quickly, it sounded, it sounded great. Instruments, studios, engineers, we used a great guy to mix it called Tim Palmer, uh, who did a great job mixing it. Another very expensive studio in Los Angeles. All of these things were finally available to me um, to make the record sound 
as good as it possibly could. And I still think it's probably the best sounding Porcupine Tree record. Oh, Paul Northfield was fantastic. Uh, I mean, very, very experienced uh, engineer. So we couldn't have hoped for a, for a better scenario with that studio and that engineer. It would have been crazy if it didn't sound really good. Probably not the greatest environment for me, but on the other hand, from a production point of view, being part of the, the album, um, it was exciting because it was somewhere different. We were right in the middle of New York, so it's, a, it's an amazing vibe. It does rub off on you in the end, where, wherever you're recording. I think it was perfect for that album. I loved every minute of it, and, to, and, it, you know, and it was easy. There was nothing about that rec recording process that was painful. It was, it was a pleasure to make. Everything sounded good right at the beginning, right through the process, everything fell into place and clicked. And it's not something sometimes you can plan for. There's a lot of luck involved. I just remember Gavin taking loads of money off me for beating me at darts. I remember they had a dartboard uh, um, in the studio and Richard likes a little bit of a flutter and I think I took about a hundred dollars off him <laughs> playing darts. They had a darts board. And he took all my per diems off me. <laughs> so I just had to survive on tuna sandwiches the whole mm -hmm. time. We're just trying to compete for the best uh, hypochondriac of the year award. Well, Gavin, I refuse to be out there. You're on a hide into nothing, Gavin, mate. I tell really? you. Really? Oh, I was talking across a world champion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you sort of settle in the dynamics of the personalities of the band. Uh, yeah. I better leave that one to you then. There's a joke somewhere. I mean, we were there to work, so it wasn't a social kind of thing. And I was very keen to get on with the job and get it done, you know, a studio like that with an engineer, we must have been pushing two or three thousand dollars a day. So it wasn't something, probably shouldn't have been playing darts for a couple of hours anyway. And uh, it, was a, it was a very positive 10 days for me. I think they had assigned two weeks to do the drums and I think I got them all done in about eight days. My uh, setup there with the, all the analog vintage analog synths. I had my semi-modular, the System 700, uh, the Prophet 5, and uh, Micro Moog, uh, as well as some virtual analog uh, synths. But yeah, so I had everything there. Um, I'd be working with headphones while listening to the music. And I do that all day long, really, um, while others are recording. So I'm, I'm coming up with sounds, ideas. So when it's my turn, I've got things prepared. So I can kind of instantly start creating some kind of an atmosphere. I might wanna just do this sound of maybe a combination of two or three scents that produces these sounds like kind of uh, insects in, in like the, that you get in the night air, you know, in, in a quiet place. And you think, well, what's this? We're, doing, we're making music here, why are you? But it's this atmosphere that, that is forming part of the backdrop and it's painting the picture and it's sympathetic to the lyrics and to the mood. So that's hard sometimes to get across in a studio. Um, but we did get stuff like that done. So on the first day, the plan was to record uh, the drums onto uh, analog tape. And we bought 20 rolls of two inch 24 track tape, which is very, very expensive. The problem with recording onto analog tape from a drummer's point of view, because I probably had something like 18 or 20 mics live in the room, is that you, it's very hard to drop in and drop out of record. So you need to really play the whole song in one go without any mistakes. So we did an experiment on the first day you know, how many times do you get a chance to be in one of the world's finest studios and do the most perfect A-B test? So we sent all of my drums to uh, the analog tape machine. Simultaneously, all the drums are also going through Apogee converters and onto the computer for hard disk recording. I played Blackest Eyes and then all of us, we sat there and compared the two. 
the digital version versus the analog version. And all of us picked the digital version. There wasn't even a contest. It was so much better. That kind of mystique about, oh, analog tape, it's great, it's fantastic. That's to do with sort of nostalgia and what your memory of some albums that were recorded on analog tape that might be one of your favorite albums. But in an absolute A-B test, in one of the world's best studios, we all unanimously said, digital is better. So that was quite a relief for me. And so the way I like to work is I like to do four whole takes from beginning to end that I'm happy with. And then I listen through all four takes and pick the one that's got the best vibe, the best groove, the best overall feeling. And then out of the other three, there might be one section or, you know, just the last third of the song, I kind of played it better on, you know, another take. And then you can do an edit on digital, which is absolutely seamless. To do that on tape, would have been a nightmare. So day one, we sent 19 reels of tape back to the shop to try to get a refund. I want to record this album in America and, and uh, I want to take the opportunity to, because I felt to myself, maybe this is the only chance I'm ever going to have to do this, to actually, we had a really good budget for the album, major label, finally a good budget to make a record. I wanted to do it in America. I wanted to live in New York for a few weeks while we did it. I wanted to um, have a great engineer. Uh, I, want, I still wanted to produce it myself. I didn't trust anyone else to produce it. I wanted to experience what it would be like to make a record in another country in a state-of-the-art recording facility without feeling the pressure of time. Well, I wasn't really given any direction. I mean, I, with every album or every session I do, I try to think what I'd like to hear from the drums for that particular song. Maybe not the most obvious part. Steve had programmed all the drums on the demo and some of it I thought was really good. So I thought, okay, I'll just copy that and take the credit for it. I never really had that much discussion about most of the parts, you know. Sometimes it's the same thing with anything. I mean, if I listen to the demo, uh, and sometimes you, you can't really deviate much from what's going on because the, there's an integral part in the bass or whatever. So something like Wedding Nails, for example, there wasn't much room to do anything else outside of the, the main part because it's, it is what it is. So you just, you're looking to get a good performance and a good sound and to maybe improve a few things or do a few fills or, you know, but it is what it is. Um, but other things were kind of wide open. Sound and music, for example, was completely... Steve didn't give me any direction. I came up with the bass line, and then I came up with a big silence in the verse, which I was very happy with. I thought actually not playing in the verse was the right thing. There's always a bit of, you know, improvisation on the day and what you might try out live in the studio. There's also quite a lot of pressure when you're in an expensive studio. And of course I had quite an audience as well because there was Steve, Richard, Colin, Paul Northfield, Andy Leff and Andy Carp all standing at the control room watching me and filming, which isn't always the ideal sort of scenario to be in when you're trying to be creative. Because to really be creative, you've got to sort of mentally undress and that can be uncomfortable in front of a lot of other people. I've never ever known any singer in any band want to stand in the uh, live room with a microphone with all the band watching and do their vocals. Playing more metal based music was quite a hard thing for me to do. But I enjoyed doing that. And it led to Steve introducing me to the music of Meshuggah, the fantastic Swedish metal band. And um, shortly after we recorded in Absentia, I was doing a series of drum clinics. And I said to Steve, look, I'm gonna write a piece inspired by Meshuggah because it would be really nice to play with that sort of thing. 
So I wrote this demo and I said to Steve, could you bring your guitar around and track along to this thing so I can play for drum clinics? And that turned into a song called Futile, which might be one of our heaviest pieces we ever wrote and recorded. There's not a lot you can do on a guitar that's going to sound different or unique. The electric guitar has a very, very well-established musical vocabulary. And if you play, I was playing in drop D tuning, which means that you, you just drop the bottom string down one whole tone. You can play heavy riffs with open, the last, the bottom three strings, open strings, and you can just bar them. And Blackie Size is one of the dumbest, most obvious examples of that. And I can't, it's one of those things, I can't believe someone hadn't written that riff already. In fact, they probably have. You probably find something where it sounds very similar. Because there's only so many riffs you can write on a guitar. And I think that's part of the problem with rock music right now, is there's nothing left to say with the electric guitar. There is nothing you can say with the electric guitar that hasn't been said before. Every riff has been written. Jimmy Page wrote half of them. Tony Iommi wrote the other half. And there's very little else left, you know. But there was a couple I was proud of on that record. I think the riff on, on Blackie Styles is, is, yeah, it's a good one. In, the, in that particular genre, it's a good drop D heavy metal guitar riff. It's fun to play live. And likewise, uh, Creator Has a Master Tape it had a very straight bass line that didn't really have any room for, oh, I was going to say room for improvement. <laughs> In a sense, there was nowhere. There was nowhere else to take it. It had that kind of insistent groove, and that's kind of part of the track. So uh, I wasn't going to change that. Some of the other tracks had a bit more freedom, or a bit more, a bit more open to interpretation, I guess you'd say. But that's it's a judgment call. It's you and the producer, if you like. But I didn't really have any big discussions with Steve about stuff. You can be the crummiest DJ in the world, right? But as long as you can do this you'll get the audience on your side. And there's something about that with heavy metal riffs as well. Otherwise it's all pretty standard, drop D, metal fare, fun but hardly innovative. I think, I think what was innovative about the record was taking those elements and combining them with the other things, the songwriting, the more textural elements, the stuff that Richard was doing, sound design, the big harmony vocal choruses, Putting like harmony vocal choruses together with big dumb metal riffs, that was different. That was what hardly anyone else was doing. That's where the innovation, I think, is in, in, in absentia. With Gravity Islands, you know, I just did what I wanted. In fact, I think we ended up keeping my original sort of demo take, um, the first thing I played, because it just fit. And there was no nothing to be gained by doing it over and over again. When I started out writing lyrics, I didn't really have the confidence to be direct about what I meant, about what I was saying, so I used a lot of sort of um, sur what you might call surrealist imagery and just trying to make things sound nice, poetic, but with no meaning. And I got to the point around Signify, which was two or three albums before In Absentia, where I felt like, you know what, I want to write, I want to write about... I want to write about life, I want to write about things that mean something to me, and I want to be more literal. And really the only thing I can point to and say this was a kind of a way that I found to do that was just by trial and error. I mean, I didn't, I didn't go away and sort of read poetry books or, you know, I was always reading. When I was a kid, I was reading. I was still reading at the time. I think for me, what makes a good lyric is obviously it's not poetry. You're not trying to write poetry. It has to have a musicality about it. It has to work within the context of the music, so it has to have a melody to it as well as a, a sort of a, a, you know, content, lyrical content. At the same time, you have to avoid, or it's, I, I like to avoid, falling back on 
cliche and sort of clumsy sort of metaphor. And if you read a lot of bad pop and rock lyrics, that's the hallmark. It's bad metaphor. Silly rhymes and tears flowing into mm. lakes and all that kind of stuff. And the real kind of cliched imagery that we've all heard a million times before. When you read a really impressive lyric, it's something which avoids cliche, avoids the obvious, but it still speaks to you in a very direct way. Um, and it has a beauty to it which is completely connected to the performance, the music. Mm. So it's not something that you should read off the page. I mean, some mm. great lyrics you can read. I mean, you can read Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell lyrics off the page, but you can read Morrissey lyrics off the page. They're still good and they're still funny. But I think there's something about really great lyrics that it's the combination of the words and the performance and the delivery that makes them transcendent. You know, it's like trying to bottle lightning. I mean, you can't, you can't really put your finger on what it is, but I think what you can do is if you're a good artist as opposed to a, a not very good one, is that you know, you still produce a lot of shit and you still write a lot of cliched crap, but the point is that you know, you know it's cliched crap and you throw it away and you start again. I still write songs which are not so good, and but you know, sometimes, uh, I have to go with it because it just sounds good in the context of the music. And that's mm. that's the other thing important about writing songs, I think. Sometimes you have to allow yourself to go with a, say, not-so-great lyric because it rocks in context. Somehow it sounds right, it rocks. Simplicity sometimes is the only thing. Finding the spaces um, within that material was, um, was key. I'm not a musician who has to kind of um, play all over something. To kind of to donate my, denote my worth to, to the piece of music. Um, if something is sounding great, then I'm not going to do something for the sake of it. Also, if you can respect the spaces, even when there is a space and you think maybe I should do something here, but if it's just right, then then just leave it. Because it's, a, it's the spaces between events that make things more interesting. So it was tough, but I, that was a challenge to frame, frame this, this music with, with uh, atmospheres and with things that were sympathetic to the lyrics to create a kind of a vibe and atmosphere that hopefully gives the music something a little bit different, it just takes you to another place. Around the time of In Absentia, I was reading a, a, a biography of a, a very famous British serial killer, actually two British serial killers, there were a couple, called The Wests, Fred and Rosemary West. And I read this wonderful book called Happy Like Murderers, which was very different from most serial killer autobiographies because it was written from the perspective of the victims. And it was really, some of the victims that survived, for example, and it was really eerie to kind of see the story unfold from that perspective. And, I mean, I've always been fascinated with serial killers ever since my mum, you know, had books about serial killers around the house and I would pick them up and I would immediately be captivated. And the, some people think well, that's really quite, you know, twisted to be interested in that kind of stuff. My kind of reply to that is that I think in many ways we're always most fascinated with the things that we have the, the hardest time understanding. So I'm fascinated by all facets of human psychology and life because I don't understand them, because I'm trying to understand how someone could have so little empathy for another human being that they could treat them like a, a toy to be used, abused, and then killed and discarded. That for me is fascinating because, because I don't understand it and because I have no empathy for those people at all. And I was reading these books and I was actually captivated, fascinated by it. There are people like this that really do walk the same planet that we do. That kind of is the main 
concept running running throughout, and um, yeah, it re resonates very strongly. The horrific kind of side to it comes through in some of those tracks. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to the serial killer stuff. Uh, you know, the, the whole uh, we all read the Fred and Rose West books on the on the bus on the previous tour, except for Gavin, of course, who wasn't there. Um, so I knew about this kind of obsession that he had with the serial killers and stuff. But I mean, it's not like it's a concept album because you've got a song about the music biz in the middle and a song about 9-11. And uh, I don't know if that really is true to say it's a concept album that all hangs around a serial killer. And so a lot of the songs ended up exploring that kind of subject matter, also extreme, you know, appetites for things like violence and sexual violence. But at the same time, trying to make the songs still have a sort of poetry to them. And the stuff like uh, Strip the Soul, just try to introduce this kind of brutal, ugly kind of sounds and, and just this um, uncomfortable, uncomfortable sort of um, atmosphere. And then there were other songs on the record which had nothing to do with like the sound of music. It was obviously a commentary on what I saw as as a sort of um, a negative, shall we say, a downward sort of spiral in the way that people were engaging with music. And this is this is 2001, remember, and it's not got better; it's got worse. You know, now it's even worse now. But even at that time, I think I was conscious that people were not engaging with music in the way that I remember engaging with music when I was a kid, and that I found frustrating and upsetting so I wrote that that song called Sound of Music. Uh, you know the music biz it wasn't something I particularly it wasn't a subject I thought was worthy of ranting <laughs> although Sound of Music's uh, definitely um, kind of come true actually it was quite prophetic of him uh, you know the sort of music has definitely been devalued uh, certainly in the last 20 25 years uh, so I can see that where he came from with that one. It's always a kind of at odds with with artists trying to trying to make art. Um, it's worse now, for sure. But there wasn't too much to complain about then. Now, now we see what we're presented with at the moment. Um, I mean, in fact, going back to the seventies, it was great because record companies would just give you large sums of money to record albums and. and you know, of course you'd be ripped off with the, the royalty rates and you'd, you'd struggle to ever pay back that, that amount of money invested, but the investment did allow you to go into studios, to go on tour and to make these albums. And it got you a lot of artists to the point where they had a profile and that was then a career. And you would never get that step up in today's climate. Sound of Music, the song we recorded on the second day, it has quite a signature sort of drum part, um, most of which I ripped off Steve's drum programming and added a few bits on top. That song just went really easy. I think it might be my first or second take. I didn't even bother doing four takes and thinking about editing. I think within two takes, I felt like I'd captured what I wanted to play on that song. And it just, it, I don't know, it just felt right. It was a nice, it was a nice day.
bass line I came up with in the chorus was another thing that I tried to to have a sort of hook. Uh, so it's going along with an odd time uh, rhythm underneath. So it's sort of not quite predictable. I think it resolves in, in a really nice way. You get this tension and release going on. So it certainly proved to be a really good live number. And it does work well, yeah. The combination between the drums and guitars. I don't know why everybody loves that track. Probably people's favourite tracks are from that album, Trains, Sound of Music, Blackest Eyes. They're probably the most popular book of country songs, I guess. <laughs> And then some of the other songs on the record were just sort of short stories. The Heart Attack in a Lay-By was about a guy that's had an argument with his partner and he's driving home and he's going to make up with her and he's going to have, it's going to be this wonderful kind of reunion and reconciliation. And he's thinking about what he's going to say to her, but he doesn't realise that he's never going to make it home because he's, he's, he's literally dying in, in a, in a lay-by at the side of the road. He's having a heart attack and he doesn't even know it. And I thought that was such a sad, beautiful, uh, tragic but very emotional uh, subject to write a, a short story you know about, you know a lot of my songs I think of as as short stories and, and you know a lot of them have unhappy endings unfortunately that's just me I pull off the road east of Baldock and Nashville feeling for myself So for that track, I tried to I tried to paint this picture to start with, um, because you have this guy who's pulled over to the side of the road, and I always got the feeling it was kind of in the evening, and it was in a kind of hot location. I mean, he's struggling to breathe because he's on the verge of a heart attack, but um, I just got the feeling of, of of what was going on around it, and so I just tried to kind of find these sounds that gave you the night, the night, the sky, the night area these insect sounds and just this sort of like whirring that, that kind of keeps going through the track. It's pretty subtle. Um, again, I played uh, Fender Rhodes on some of that as well. Show me some of your chops. You're reminding us of... The first time and the second time it goes twice, yeah. Well that was another song where I just play very simple notes and I just concentrate on getting a, a nice sound, a good or appropriate sound on the bass, but it's, it's another very long note. <laughs> um, it's not difficult to play or anything, it's just uh, playing it with intention, yeah, that's, the, that's the idea. I like Heart Attack in a Lay-By. I think that's a beautiful song, really beautiful song. The drums play almost nothing at all in that. I just like the composition. I like the lyrics. It's, it's quite a powerful piece, actually. Something I've always kind of aimed for is to get that kind of mixture of, of melancholy, but also um, something which really touches people in a way that is without wishing to sound pretentious, is completely about the human condition. And the human condition in reality is that a lot of the time we are not happy. And we do have tragedy in our lives and we do have, unfortunately we do have to deal with things like death and loss and regret 
And I think there's something very beautiful about being able to share that burden through songs, through art, you know, creating something which then people can listen to or watch or read or whatever, and then to understand that they're not the only ones that feel those things and they're not the only ones that go through those things. So a song like Heart Attack and a Lay By for me, although it's a very tragic story, uh, I think touches a lot of people. Blackest Eyes would be probably the track at that time where if somebody said to you, what's Porcupine Tree's music like, and you sum it up, I'd just tell them to play that track because that, that kind of had a little bit of everything that, that was part of Porcupine Tree's kind of signature sound in a way. It had the new, the new kind of heavier, heavier riff in, the powerful drums, good song, good concept, um, it had the middle section, which I did most of that middle section and created this kind of vibe in a, in a short space of time, um, and a little bit as well towards the end. Um, all compressed within quite a short amount of time, and that that kind of was the art of of of, of that album, I think. I'm not someone who is consciously aware of technique when I'm drumming. I don't think about my technique when I'm drumming. I try to just think about the music. And I guess the technique, as you start to play heavier, you just find a way of doing it. Your grip changes. You might choose bigger drumsticks and you just find a way to make it work. And I suppose my, drum, my drumming style changed uh, from the period of joining Porcupine Tree, I did start to hit the drums harder and play louder and more aggressively than I'd ever done before. I think it's a great body of material. I think all the songs are, are really wonderful. But there are certain songs that for me that just came out sounding even better than I could have hoped. Um, Blackest Eyes, definitely. Creator. I think when Gavin played the drums on Creator, it suddenly made a song that for me I wasn't sure about. It was I was like, yeah, this is this is going to be killer, you know. That right here. Okay, I like to zoom in into that. He's so prepared. He's like so on top of every nuance of this. That one, I used three hi-hats for. So when you play really fast, and traditionally your, your hi-hat is on the left, and if you play really fast and loud, it's very hard to hit the snare drum consistently hard whilst your right hand is over the top. This is something I, I started doing when I was with Iggy Pop, was I put a second hi-hat here on the right side so I could play it in a comfortable, easy motion and leave a big space to hit the snare drum hard. And then if I want to play an open hi-hat, I'd have to, because this one's permanently closed. There's no pedal to it. It was just two hi-hats clamped together. And then if you want to play an open hi-hat, you're going to have to do it with your left hand or your right hand over there. And then I had another little hi-hat, which was two splash cymbals, um, almost closed, but they were sort of slightly loose. And I mounted that close to the second hi-hat. So I developed this pattern that I could play uh, that particular song, and I could hit these two little uh, hi-hats together as part of the pattern of that song. And that became very difficult to play live without that second hi-hat. So I always use that as an excuse <laughs> to not want to play that song live because it's really tiring. Really, really tiring.
very first show I ever played with Porcupine Tree was at um, the Middle East Club in Boston. And Steve thought it'd be a great idea if we started with Creator Had a Master Tape. And he said, why don't you go on and play about 32 bars on your own and then we'll come in. Uh, so that was the very first thing I ever played live. Uh, there was probably about 35 people there. <laughs> Collapse the Light into Earth came out great. I mean, it's only, I think it's only me on that track on the album. There's a couple of tracks on the album that's just, um, it's just, I think, Collapse and Lips of Ashes. Maybe Rich is doing some electronic stuff. They're very much similar to the way I demoed them, those two songs. They didn't really change much in the studio. Um, I'm very proud of those two songs. Lips of Ashes is a, it's a beautiful piece. I remember adding lots of textures to it. Stephen already had this beautiful kind of, uh, I think it's a dulcimer. It's like an effective dulcimer with, with uh, Swampton Reverb produces this beautiful sound and that's, that's predominant throughout. I think mainly I did all this kind of high, high atmospherics above. There's a lot of kind of um, filtered, um, kind of like string lines. So a, a lot of kind of stuff going on up there. And then I think I introduced this, this quite deep, um, low sub synth about halfway through that suddenly you kind of you, you can feel in your in your stomach um, that worked pretty well but i think i think again the main the main sound there for me is this dulcimer thing that steve played i thought collapse light into earth was a very powerful piece of music i, mean, I don't even play on that one but it was a very powerful song uh, and it, when you know what it's about it makes a lot of sense on september 11 um or the 11th of september as we say in, in england um i was home and i was in my studio and i was working on, on a song i don't remember what the song was but i do know this that two about two days later i wrote collapse the light into earth which is the final song on the record and it was kind of for me it was a requiem for for um 9 11. It wasn't a song about 9-11, it's a love song, but there's something, there's a feeling uh, imbued in the song, which is absolutely for me to do with 9-11. It's like William Basinski's Disintegration Loops. It's got nothing to do with 9-11, but it's, there's, some, there's a quality in that music which somehow connects with that time and that event. It's my song that I associate and I think a lot of the fans also associate with the feelings that I had in the few days after the world changed uh, forever the world changed forever uh, you know I was in my studio working on on, um, on a song I probably never finished that song I probably should should never have finished that song Yeah, it was quite a heavy piece. Uh, as I said, I'd never played such heavy music before. I mean, I guess it, at least metal style music. Uh, I'd played quite heavy punk music with Iggy Pop back in the 80s, but that was quite a challenge, you know, physically and mentally to, to play at that level of intensity. And also when we played it live, there were quite a few songs that were really hard to pull off live um, because of the amount of energy and stamina you need to play the drums in that style.
yes, Wedding Nails was um, a, uh, a co-write between me and Stephen, I guess because I, I kind of wrote the basis for the middle and the end sections and I created this kind of sound design thing. Stephen already had this space put aside and had certain atmospherics going but I tried to kind of take this, these sounds into the cellar, so to speak, and um, make it very dark and I, I kind of imagined like chains scraping on the ground and very kind of a burial type thing um, going on. And I used my sister's um, musical box that I recorded and, and kind of uh, affected through the, through the synths and kind of warped that sound and, and, and used some of that. And also there was a lot of treated piano and uh, kind of scraping on strings. And well, we don't talk too much about those because the studios knew what you were doing to their, their pianos, they go crazy. Um, yeah, treated piano. And I, I just wanted this really subterranean sort of um, feeling of this claustrophobic cellar, which is quite in keeping with the general kind of concept of some of those songs in that album. <laughs> So Strip the Soul was, uh, I can remember doing a version of um, Strip the Soul where I had my, I had an interesting pattern in six on my drum machine and I came up with the bass line. discovered with Steve the best way to kind of give him things to work with was to give him little elements of stuff that if he liked he could build things in there. So it came out of a demo, I've still got it somewhere on a mini disc. One of the hardest songs to play from that record was Strip the Soul, mainly because it's, it's a lot slower than you kind of imagine it to be and it was hard to get the feel kind of right when we played it live. It wasn't that physically challenging like Creator Had a Master Tape was, but um, Strip the Soul, that's quite a hard song to really pull off really well. That is a Fender Rhodes, yeah. Always nice to play um, play on these instruments in, in, in studios that you, you wouldn't normally get to, get to play on. Now, things like Hammond organ, Fender Rhodes, Wurlitz and pianos. Clevinets. I did a kind of solo, a little solo in Strip the Soul. Stephen put some distortion, had some distortion on it in the studio, I think. Uh, it worked really well. It's a, it's a totally different experience playing something like that to synths, and it's quite enjoyable. It's quite rare for me to do that, but um, yeah, I enjoyed that. It worked really well. <laughs> around and worked on it together and he'd had a couple of other things going on around it and then I did something else to that track that he had at the time and that became Dot 3. That was all built around the other bass line that I came up with. And Dot 3 is beautiful. The orchestra, the whole vibe of it is just really really nice. It has this kind of slight massive attack feel to it, sort of laid back kind of feel and um, this, this whole textures and orchestra just sort of washes over you really. I could listen to that for, for ages. You know. But there's a funny thing that happens when you repeat things over and over again is that you, you start hearing the detail and you can get locked into a rhythm. It's one of the things I enjoy about playing the bass is, is having a repetitive, I like the, the idea of repetition in music. Mm -hmm. uh, in certain places it's, it's very powerful. There was one song I thought was going to be one of the best songs ever. It was a song called Drown With Me. It 
didn't quite come out the way I wanted to. So in a way, this is contradicting what I said a minute ago. I said everything worked. Not everything worked. Uh, everything was fun, and most things worked. But Drown With Me is the one exception to that. It's a song that I really thought was going to be one of the highlights of the album, and it just never sounded right to me. And uh, I left it off the record, and I think it's a shame, because I think it's one of the better songs, but it wasn't one of the better recordings. Mm. And then Prodigal, which I think is one of the weaker songs, actually came out recording-wise sounding pretty good. So it ended up being on the record instead of Drown With Me. And that's, the, if I have one regret, that's it. That Drown With Me should have been on the record and Prodigal probably shouldn't have been. And that's just a very personal thing. I'm, there might be people out there that love it. Listen, I love Prodigal. I think it's a good song. But to me, there, were, there was a better song that should have been in its place. Yeah. Prodigal, there was a moment where I had a chance to do what I call a rhythmic illusion. A rhythmic illusion is something that you can superimpose to give the impression to the audience that the tempo has changed or the place, the downbeat where the one is, has also moved. It is an illusion. I'm not really changing tempo or moving the downbeat. You can give the impression that you're changing a downbeat by something called displacement. So you play exactly what you'd play in a normal, let's say, 4-4 beat, but you just start it in a different place in the bar. So when you move it into a different place, it presents the listener with a bit of a dilemma. It sounds like we've done an odd time signature and that now the, the downbeat and the backbeat have moved. The way you can give the impression that the tempo has changed is by uh, changing the subdivision. So let's say you're playing in eighth notes, if you start to play in triplets and then you keep the spacing of the bass drum and the snare drum the same, it will sound like you've slowed down or sped up in a weird amount, um, usually two thirds. So it gives the impression that that the tempo's changed, it, it's just an illusion. And I used a little bit of that, a tiny bit of that in Prodigy. Getting action shots. This is terrible. This is the whole thing. Putting you off. Yeah. I hate being at the piano. <laughs> the keyboard solo on Gravity Eyelids, um, yeah, I'm very happy with that. Um, I'm not really a soloist as such. I'll play solos, but I don't know how much they qualify as, as solos in the, in the rock world. Um, but um, yeah, that, that, that was my usual kind of approach of the Prophet with um, distortion and a lot of a noise modulation as well, which interacts really nicely with the, the pedal. Also, towards the end of that solo, you can hear a kind of uh, like this laser gun type thing. It's, it's just actually swapping through patches and then going back to my solo sound and then swapping through more patches. So, I mean, I just try to do abstract things during a solo. Um, and that, that worked quite nicely, I think. And, and it worked live as well. Uh, I was doing, a, I was very conscious of the length of the note. Uh, you know, you can play a note and then you can let it ring. It's another thing that people don't think about very much, but you can, some players don't think about it very much. You can play a note and let it ring and hold it and then stop it and you get the space. And I was kind of thinking about that with gravity on it, with the, the slides. Um, I'm not playing anything particularly difficult, but it becomes powerful in the sort of intention in the way that you play it. And that was kind of what I was aiming for. Well, I suppose the song that exceeded all expectations, I 
guess has to be trains because I really didn't like the uh, middle section of trains with the hand clapping and the sort of made me think of river dance or people kind of doing this and I, I just really didn't like it and I, but it's become like the most popular thing and having played it hundreds of times it's the highlight of the show where all the audience join in and everybody loves it and it's become this so I mean I was so wrong about that let him have it Richard let him have it no I don't think I don't think that works really What, what does it sound like? Dishes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I see. When's your last day? We can't leave. I am aware that Trains is the most popular song on the record, and I think that's actually overrated. I think it's a good song, but I don't even think it's the best song on the record, you know. But most people would disagree with me, you know. In fact, the first tour we did, we didn't even play that song. We didn't even play Trains on the first tour. And then people kept saying to us, why are you not playing Trains? It's the best track on the album. And I'm like, no, it isn't. <laughs> and then eventually I started to realize this seemed to be a unanimous opinion that Trains is the best. So we started playing it live and, and the rest is history. It's become a very popular song. Certainly the Porcupine Tree's most popular song. Sometimes the music becomes public property and it's no longer your own, you know. And uh, the fans will tell you what are the good songs and you can disagree with them and I do quite often disagree with them but it's been very interesting to see how Trains has kind of consistently kind of risen to the top of the pile uh, and I don't even think it's the best song on the record let alone best Porcupine Tree song but there you go I like it I'm, I'm certainly not I'm certainly proud of it but not not to that extent it was always something that people got into at the end of a gig we usually played it right at the end and it was a a real crowd pleaser, um, which I couldn't, something I couldn't have predicted. But that's the thing about art in general, I guess it has a life of its own. And you can't second guess what other people see in it, what other people get out of it. So uh, a train is something that's kind of universal. <laughs> Symbolically, it's a universal thing. I'm still writing songs about um, nostalgia for childhood. It's one of the tragic things that when you're a child you don't appreciate it and then when you're grown up you spend most of your adult life wishing you were still a child, wishing you could go back and, and kind of enjoy it for what it was, which was an incredible time in your life when you have no responsibility. Everything is magical. Everything is a new discovery. And, and I, I have a lot of nostalgia for that time in my life. Partly because I don't think I was very happy as a child. I wish I, I, I should have been, but I don't think I was very happy as a child. And I'm a lot happier now, but um, I look back at the child version of myself and think, well, you really should have enjoyed it uh, more than you did. So songs like Trains, which for me are, you know, they're very much kind of um, a longing for a time in my life when I did have a sense of awe and a sense of wonder about everything, you know all the music I was hearing, all the books I was reading, all the movies I was discovering, even the sounds of, you know, the sound of trains is still, it, it still has a kind of Pavlovian effect on me. When I hear it, I kind of instantly am transported back to my childhood because I grew up within distance of a train station. And when I was going to sleep at night, I would hear the sound of trains coming into the station and going out. And it's something that has become almost like a soundtrack to um, to my past and to my childhood. Maybe people can't relate so much to, to serial killers or to the death of the music industry, but they can, everyone can relate to a song about nostalgia for childhood. I can't imagine any more space for, for anything else somehow. It still surprises me how many tracks are on that album. I think when I was putting together the final running order from In Absentia, I already knew what the first song and the last song was going to be. I, I think as soon as I'd written Blackie Styles, I knew it was the opener. And as soon as I'd written Collapse the Light, I knew it was the closing song. The rest I didn't know. And it, you know, I, I can't really explain how, how sequencing an album works, except that you just instinctively know to me, the analogy is always, I always give is you're trying to make a movie here. You're trying to make a movie for the ears. And when you make a movie, you're, t you're telling a story. And you know that the scenes have to be in exactly the right order and able to be able to tell the story in a logical way that feels satisfying. 
And it's the same with music. I think you're looking for the perfect combination, the perfect, perfect flow of scenes or songs in this case that seems to tell the story. And I don't mean literally tell the story. I don't mean tell the story in terms of, you know, the words. I mean tell a musical story, take the listener on a journey. And I think if I'm good at anything, and I don't think I'm good at everything, I think I'm terrible at some things, but I think one thing I am really good at is being able to sequence albums and songs. I think that is something I'm good at. Partly, I think, because of my love of cinema and movies and the kind of internal logic that movies have to have if they're going to work. And I've always felt that way about music, too. You know, I'm growing up hearing albums like Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall and, and the Floyd conceptual rock records and understanding that there is something about those albums that works because of the flow. Not the songs themselves, which are amazing, by the way, but sometimes weaker songs can feel stronger if they're sequenced well, and the other way around. A great song can feel not so good if it's in the wrong place in the sequence. So there is a real art to that. I think I was pleased with how most of it turned out. The Sound of Muzak turned out really nice. It, the mix of it's really nice. Uh, you know, you can really hear the tone of drums and uh, the whole record was quite an impressive, you know, arc of all the pieces put together. The sound we got on In Absentia was one of the better, definitely one of the better punk country albums sonically, um, because of the studio, I guess. Um, I kind of feel it's got a bit more balls as well than some of the others. In terms of songs that were completely left off the record, there's a few rec there's a few songs on the demos disc in the special edition that have never been heard. Uh, there's one called Imogen Slaughter, which I love, but it would have been completely wrong for In Absentia. It's like this sort of garagey, trashy. I think I was thinking I was Sonic Youth that day, and I love it. And Richard does this kind of crazy electronic stuff on it, but it's really twisted, and probably the fans would have hated it anyway. Not that that's ever stopped me, but um, it wouldn't have fitted on In Absentia. There's a song called Watching You Sleep, which is a really pretty song. Uh, which I never even considered as a possible for the album. We never, I don't think I even ever played it to the rest of the band. But I discovered it while I was, I was excavating this, the session tapes and, and I listened to it and I said, you know what, it's a good song, people should hear it. I think bands always make their best albums, or most distinctive albums, uh, when there's a massive change in direction. Be it an upheaval or be it a new, a new, a new kind of way of doing things or I mean, I had that in my other band, a change from like the first two albums to an album that we did called Quiet Life. It was suddenly, this sophisticated kind of sounding album. And I kind of see In Absentia as that kind of change as well. The, the songwriting, how it was sonically, um, the use of orchestra, the use of various instrumentation, the kind of very defined concepts, the artwork, everything. Everything came together. And in a way, it was condensed to, to the point where you could have 11 or 12, not how many songs on there, 12 songs. I think that was, that was the art in that album. And um, I think that's, that's why it will stand as one of the best, if not the best, Punky Pantry album. But overall, I think we made the right decisions with the track listing and and you know what was left off and what went on. I think that was we. You know, the album itself stands up as a strong. It's kind of meaningless these days in streaming, <laughs> but from beginning to end and the sequence and everything, you know, I, I still stand by the decisions. Lassa Hoyle came into my life uh, shortly after we made the album and I had no idea what I wanted. Actually, no, it's not true. I did have a strong idea what I wanted for artwork. I had this idea, which I talked to Carl Glover about, is I wanted family pictures where the faces had been ripped out or defaced, um, almost like a serial killer trying to erase his parents or his family life or his history. Um, 
and I had this idea and Carl did a great mock-up of it but everyone hated it and I, and I understand why because although conceptually it was strong it just didn't look very sexy it just didn't kind of pop as album artwork and this is the, the, we're, in, we're well into the era here now where it's all about CDs and at the time actually no one was buying vinyl even so it was going to be that big you know it's that big so the problem with my idea that Carl mocked up was it was too conceptual it didn't leap out at you the thing is that I remember that artwork it, it took a long time actually because we had a few iterations of different maybe even a couple of different designers giving us ideas which I don't think anything particularly resonated with me I can remember before being sent loads of photographs of sort of suburban American families and it's not something I can relate to because I'm, you know, it's not part of my background. America, you know, it's kind of big American cars, and it didn't work. It didn't, you know, whether that was a conscious decision to sort of appeal to the American market or not, I've no idea. But, but it, it didn't do anything for me. So we're looking for something really strong, and then one day my manager Richard Allen said, "Oh, this guy called Lasse Hoyle has contacted me from Denmark, and he sent me some of his work. Would you like to see it?" And I said, "Yeah, what the hell." He sent it over and I think it might even have been the first image I looked at uh, was the, the blue head image and I said to myself, I might even have said it out loud, I said, that's the cover, that's the cover, there it is, serial kiss, an album about serial killers, an album where you are talking about people who are somehow psychologically damaged this is a perfect image without being crass. You know, you think about how a death metal band would have interpreted that. It would have ended up looking really crass and really sort of, you know, childish. Sorry, death metal bands. And this was a really, to me, this was a really classy and not obvious way of representing mental health and people who are sick, mentally sick. And it was perfect. If I remember rightly, it was in, was it in that, that weird place in Denmark, in Copenhagen, in Chris, what's it called? Christiania. Yeah. He came in, I thought that, <laughs> I thought it was somebody who'd come to murder us. I thought I was really scared because he had this really imposing sort of presence. But um, <laughs> it was, it was the start of, of working with Lassa for, um, Wow, for, well, right up until the last album. And I remember ringing up you, Lassa. Mm -hmm. We started talking about movies and straight away I knew Lassa was somebody that I could have empathy with and would understand if I started to explain to you what I was thinking, what I was, you know, what I was writing about, what I was looking for visually. I knew straight away you would get it. Uh, and it's just a shame that you turned out to be so talentless. But, you know... I basically had to sort of stick with you because of, you know, for old time's sake. But at least you produced one good image, which is the one you did for In Absentia. It's been all shit ever since, you know, but... Never mind. One, one great image. <laughs> That's one more than most people produce. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true, Lesser. Lass has been like sort of the fifth person in the band, really, because not only the covers and the photography, but the live, the way the live show has progressed and with the production and everything. Um, people relate to it, and the videos. When you hear the music now, you can see the visuals, especially uh, on Fear of a Blank Planet as well, that, that came after. I mean, just starting from the point of the, the cover, which, there we go, got it to hand. I mean, that, that is, what more do you need to say? In a way, it's like the music, it's very to the point, it's very direct, and it's got the concept all there. I don't like that part, where we look like dug up corpses. But um, yeah, and Lass has become, a friend, somebody who's there, but we can ignore, we don't have to, it's not like when you work with other people, you, it's just part, he's just part of the thing. Um, 
and that's that's the way it's been ever since, and ever ever will be. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit tardis. <laughs> Give him a real kiss. Come on, give Richard a real kiss. Come on. <laughs> this much talent. <laughs> There he goes. Well, I think Stephen was was very keen to have Gavin join the band after the after the session. So, I mean, already when we were in New York making this album, there there were, I guess, negotiations going on behind the scenes. Andy left was was um, in awe of Gavin, and, uh, the record label Andy Carp. Um, and I guess Stephen wanted it settled so that he knew that there'd be a band going forward. I don't recall it being a difficult decision. I think it was a very easy decision to make because he'd done a really good job with the recording. Also on a personal level, he, he, uh, he was kind of, you know, easy to get along with, or so we thought. <laughs> like he's, he was easy to get along with and, and, you know, didn't seem to be any kind of issues in that department. I came back from New York and the other three guys stayed another few weeks and when they got back we had a meeting and they asked me if I would join the band and I didn't really understand what that meant it's like yeah okay I'll play in your band but I had never been a member of a band before like a partner I had spent good 25 years working as a you know independent freelance session musician and I thought well maybe it's time to see what it's like being in a band, maybe this will be an interesting um, thing to do. And he was right to join, because he's now internationally renowned. Yeah, it's all because all of us, all because of me, really. Um, it turned out all right. So really to sum up, In Absentia is, is, um, is a landmark album for, for me personally, and I think Porcupine Tree as a group, it was a landmark album because it was the first time we worked with Gavin as the drummer in the band. It was the first time the metal aspect really came to the fore. It was the first time we worked with Lassa. It was also the first time we started to experiment with things like visuals and videos on stage. It was the first time we made a record in America and focused very much on America, touring in America. And the audience began to change as well because the audience until that time had been more people like me, you know, like old hippies, you know. And suddenly we started to see kids, metal kids, um, art rock kids coming to the shows people wearing Radiohead t-shirts and Nine Inch Nails t-shirts and I love that you know I love that because I loved all these different kinds of music too so it very quickly went from being middle-aged guys in gong t-shirts to being kids in Radiohead t-shirts and Opeth t-shirts and Nine Inch Nails t-shirts and I and I really like that and I still see that diversity in the in my audience now and it began there so it was very much an album of beginnings with Pocky with the with either lineup with both lineups it's probably the case that between the four of us there's a single balanced entity <laughs> because the, we've all got strengths in certain areas and, and we've all got a slightly different perspective on things which usually meant that a group decision when we all agreed on something was actually the right thing it's all to do with how different we are from each other really i think rather than that we're all on the same wavelength I think we're all on different wavelengths, which, which helps. It's bringing it all together. I think the combination works well. I think it helps that I'm very unmusical, technically, yet I'm in a band that is also very technically proficient. I think these sort of, um, these differences, these uh, polarities sort of um, work, and it, it helps make the band what it is. And, you have the strong songwriting, you have the arrangements, 
I think it all just comes together really well. It's really the signature sound of the band. For better or worse, the way the four characters interact produces the sound of the band. You know, if you change one character in the band, the band would sound different. And it probably sounded different when I joined after Chris Maitland. Not better or worse, just different. Because, you know, people play like their character. Um, the four of us, our characters found a way to slot in. Well, honestly, In Absentia was, a, was um, not a very successful record at the time, frustratingly. I mean, we, we thought we'd made an amazing record. I thought we'd made an amazing record. I thought we had great songs, great production. It seemed to be an album for me that was completely of the time, uh, the heaviest sound, but the great songs. I thought that, you know, this is an album that can't fail. Now, I don't want to be that cliche that says the record company fucked up, they didn't market it properly except the record company fucked up and they didn't market it properly. It's definitely a defining moment because of the big record deal and the move to getting into the American market. It's one of the better albums in my opinion and I think for a lot of fans uh, it was the first album they heard. They didn't release Trains as a single and they should have done. Um, I think Andy Carp would concede now that Trains should have been the single. They picked Blackest Eyes um, which again I thought was a great song, should have been a great single. I found myself completely unable to play the promotional game that you're required to play to be successful in America, which is to go on stupid chat shows and radio shows at seven o'clock in the morning and, and I was asked to do a few of these things and I was terrible at it. I mean, I, you know, I, I couldn't do it and we did a few of those and I felt really uncomfortable about it basically thought the way to do it was to go on tour and tour a lot and we did we toured a lot i never had any expectations with porcupine tree because it took so long um to get anywhere that by the time any kind of success happened it was so slow i almost didn't believe that it would it, it would ha you know it had happened and there was it wasn't any by any means any kind of overnight thing and all you can do is do your best and then hope that it resonates with people or people dig it there's so many uh, reasons why things don't get a fair shake of the stick. We expected it to, to do better than it did, but then we always expected that. We always thought we should be selling more records, playing to more people and doing better. Um, we never stopped feeling that really. We thought we'd made this, this kind of amazing album and that everybody should hear it. I mean, the main thing is it's there, and I think uh, over over the last decade or two, um, you know, new people are coming to it all the time. Yeah, you know, I think we had a unique kind of sound going on there that was you couldn't compare it to anyone else at the time, and say, oh, it sounds like them. Maybe subsequently, some people have tried to sound a bit like Pokemon Tree. The album has been, I think, what you call a slow burn album. It's an album which continues to be rediscovered and discovered by new fans. It didn't sell a lot at the time, but I think most people now have this idea, this impression that it sold, that it did sell a lot. It really didn't. I don't know what it sold over the years. It's probably sold pretty well over the years, but at the time it sold 30, 30, 40,000 copies, which was nothing then and it's nothing now, you know. It, it was disappointing, but I think probably it's continued to sell 20,000 copies every year since it was made. So in some ways it's, a, it's something to be more proud of. It wasn't an instant success, but it's a record that continues to resonate. And I guess I'll take that. Uh, you know, I'll take that. I'm, I'm pleased, I'm pleased that it, the record has still got long, it's got longevity to it. And it still sounds good. You know, when I was remastering it, I thought, this still sounds good. The songs are good, the production is good. The lyrics, uh, you know, uh, the sentiment is all relevant still. Um, and I can understand why it is still, I think, probably on balance, the most popular Porcupine Tree record, along with F Fear of a Blank Planet. Yeah, In Absentia, Fear of a Blank Planet, they're my two favourites too, yeah. You know, we spent a lot of time together over, over those eight years. Spent an unhealthy amount of time sitting on buses and sitting in dressing rooms, hours and hours and hours. <coughs> You know, you go, you sort of grow up, your life changes, things happen in your life and it all moves along with the band. So the sound of the group is significant that the, the, the four people 
and, and five, including Wes, the five of us kind of clicked in a certain way. Five other people wouldn't click in the same way. Even if you changed one of those players, it would have an effect on the other three or four people that a new person would come in and, and change change the vibe of how we interacted and change the sound of the band by the way they played. When Porcupine Tree ended, it was because I felt like we had painted ourselves into a corner with that kind of metal crossover sound. And I didn't know what else to do with it. And I think actually after In Absentia, although we made some great music after that, In Absentia was the peak. And there was a sense of the inevitable three, four albums later. For me, it was like, okay, now I want to do something else. And In Absentia really was the defining album, stroke album cycle, stroke project which for me perhaps defined Porcupine Tree and I think defined the sound of Porcupine Tree in the minds of all the people that like that band and listen to that band, still listen to that band today. I think In Absentia, a lot of people would agree, is the defining sound of that band. And that ultimately also for me was the, the reason why it ended. And maybe that's, a, maybe that's not a bad thing, that's just an inevitable thing that happens when a band makes a defining record, um, in a sense, there's, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to go anywhere else after that. I think the band did suffer a little bit from that, um, which is why I think it was absolutely the right decision to, to finish it when we did. But In Absentia does stand for me as the kind of dual, the crowning achievement of that. That and Fear of a Blank Planet, I think partly because Fear of a Blank Planet was so conceptually strong to me, visually and, and lyrically, that had a very strong concept. In Absentia is still the best bunch of songs we ever had to draw from for an album cycle. And it still stands up as the best cycle of songs I think the band ever had. Yeah.